Hello and welcome to this Channel Voices panel discussion in association with Vertiv. I'm Sarah Ural, Consulting Editor at CRN, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Regina Blumen, Head of Brand at Logicalis, Paul Stringfellow, Technical Director at Garden Systems, and Carsten Winter, Vice President of Amir Sales at Vertiv. Welcome, everyone. So today we have about 25 to 30 minutes to discuss experiences during the ongoing pandemic and also the opportunities that have arisen out of the adversity we've all faced this year and why the future is looking bright for our industry. So first off, I'd just like to briefly get our panel to introduce themselves to our viewers before we get into the discussion. So Regina, if I could pass to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, so Regina Blumen, um, Head of Brand and Marketing at Logicalis. Um, we are a global um, systems and solutions provider um, and I am based in the UK. Fantastic. Paul? Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Stringflow, Technical Director of Gardner Systems. We're a data management consultancy uh, based in Liverpool. Um, so as, as we do this, we're, we're all getting COVID tests now, apparently. So uh, as, as we record this today. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in the industry about 25 years, uh, work with our customers at one end to understand their business needs and work with our choice of uh, technology vendors at the other end to understand their strategic direction and, and how they're hopefully going to solve uh, the problems of our customers. The fan casting, finally. Thank you very much, Harris. Yep. So, Carsten Winter, I'm heading up the sales community across EMEA in Verdiv. Um, and as I hopefully you all know, since you're here, we are probably the biggest independent uh, data center equipment provider in the world. Very happy to work with you all. Good stuff. Thank you very much. So, if we're going to our first question, and Regina, I'm going to direct this one at you first of all. Yeah. Um, what have been the biggest technology challenges for, for you, yourselves and your customers this year and, and how have you tackled those? Um, so I think probably our biggest has been really similar to what everyone else has had to deal with in terms of scaling everything to get people working from home quickly. Um, once that was kind of, once people got that sorted, um, I think security has really jumped out as the, the big topic. Um, you know, you've got things from phishing emails, people sending out, you know, click here to find out more about what we're doing around COVID um, and people are desperate for information. So it's um, it's created a lot more opportunities um, for security breaches at home. Um, you get people who have poor broadband and so they download things locally and work locally. Um, so that's really been a, a big um, step forward for us as we've, we've started to have a lot more conversations around security with our customers. Um, and we're seeing that that's, definitely their biggest concern once they've got the home working out of the way. And Paul, is that a similar scenario for you? Yeah, I think all of those things. You know, it, uh, ab absolutely. I mean, certainly the initial thing was, I, th I think what was interesting from our point of view was that those customers that had already started to make um, s some strides into work towards modernization of the, the way they operated, you know, and, and I think in a lot of those cases, it meant have probably made a move to Office 365. Um, and, it, you know, and although that's not the answer to every, every problem, I think we found for a lot of our customers where they'd already start, started that digital transformation journey for, for want to an IT buzzword, um, they found the immediate change that they had to make back in March so much easier than those that were still very much embedded in traditional ways of working um, because that, that then all, all things that, that Reg talked about there about the idea of how do we scale this how do we handle our VPNs how do we make sure that um, you know that our users all had equipment that they needed I think once they had that flexibility in place that was much easier for them um, I think I think a couple of other things that we spotted though in terms of technology challenges I think support has been a huge issue um, I think for quite a lot of our customers, the idea that um, the thing with enterprise IT is enterprise IT is designed for the enterprise and it's designed for you to have enterprise engineers coming out and deploying it on people's desktops. The idea that suddenly all of those users are now in a consumer environment at home and are used to using consumer technology, hooking up with consumer broadband, consumer Wi-Fi. Suddenly that was a was a huge issue for people. How do we how on earth do we support that? And I think we see that going forward as well, that, that that's going to be a huge issue. Um, and then I think maybe not necessarily a technology challenge, but I think that idea of uncertainty was a was a big issue for people. They didn't know what changes they need to make, how long they needed to make the changes for. And then uncertainty in terms of you know, where, where are we going to be as an organization for technology investments? You know, can, can we do projects A, B and C 
knowing what we know now, you know, and I, and I think from, I'm not sure we'll come to this, but I think from a channel point of view, of course, that stopped dead quite a lot of projects, quite a lot of planning. Um, and and we, we had to, to deal with that. I mean, we're fortunate. We've done a lot of work with the health service uh, over the last seven or eight months. So as you can imagine, that's kept us relatively busy. And Kelsey, from a, a vendor point of view, how, how have the challenges been for you? Well, I think um, obviously uh, going from almost one day to the other, actually having to support remote working uh, was a huge challenge. Uh, obviously trying to keep at one point uh, momentum and productivity within the workforce, uh, while at the same time allowing everybody to have access. So I can definitely second to what Regina was talking about in terms of security uh, was a big topic for us uh, internally. I would say for talking about customers, uh, obviously, as we are supporting thousands of, uh, you know, physical sites around EMEA, um, there has been a tremendous effort in trying to actually keep those sites up and running. There's a, an element of a huge element of safety involved. So, you know, we have thousands of technicians running around EMEA actually having to, to you know, doing uh, battery services, uh, installing equipment, um, and at the same time, obviously, trying to keep everybody safe in, in the process. So, I think um, what we have actually seen from our customers, uh, you know, technologies like uh, monitoring services has been a big topic now. Uh, we talked about security before. Um, you know, also the way we actually balance investments. Uh, do we push them forward? Or do we actually, uh, you know, do we bounce them back or forward? And I think there's a, a number of, uh, of these type of uh, considerations that we've seen our customers actually having. So uh, I think um, keeping the equipment up and running at one point, because I think there's never been this, such a huge need for the internet being up and running and access to data as we've seen now. Um, and obviously we are in the business of providing that uh, access. So uh, a lots of, uh, lot of efforts in, the, um, in getting the equipment uh, you know, seamlessly been working has been a big, big topic for us. Yeah. And Carsten, if I could stick with you for, for the next question, how have online communication tools like Zoom, Teams, and all the other platforms that we're all very familiar with now, has it changed the way partners promote and sell their solutions, have you noticed? Well, it has. Um, well, let me say technology has changed it. Um, one way of us actually selling our solutions is very much, obviously, one thing is actually having people to meet each other. And we now have the chance of having more online, uh, but face-to-face -face sessions. It's not as personal as we want it. The interpersonal social contact that sometimes also drive relationships or even increase them uh, is somewhat removed or at least you know, reduced drastically. So some of the things that we've been forced to actually take into is that part of our customers taking decisions to, to our solutions is actually involving you know, a lot of testing on equipment. There's a lot of uh, factory acceptance testing. There's a lot of factory tours happening, you know, visiting our labs. So we, we spend a lot of time actually developing AR and VR tools actually to make that uh, possible. And we're even expanding that internally in the way we're actually driving trainings internally. Uh, so so I, would, I, think, I would think it's fair to say that um, we all probably miss the very interpersonal type of uh, communication. I think we probably all can relate to that, um, but also force us into being very innovative in the way we're actually promoting ourselves. Absolutely. Regina, it's sort of, have you noticed an increase in demand for these solutions? Yeah, massively. I mean, you know, it's, it is the kind of the only substitution we have for face to face. So it is a natural step. Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, I think um, I think interestingly, um, maybe slightly different to the other guys. That I, I think one of the things, um, and maybe that's just I don't like being in rooms with people. Maybe it's just you know <laughs> I, I don't like hanging around with people. Like this is great, um, but but I think that's a techie in me. Um, uh, but I think one of the things I've seen, I, I think if we if we'd spoken in February and you'd asked me, could I replace? all of my major meetings with customers by Zoom, Teams, whatever, um, would I feel I got the same experience with that customer as sitting in a room with them? I think in February, I would have said absolutely not, you know, because I would miss the nuance. I would miss the body language. I would miss, you know, kind of the, the that, that kind of, you know, un unnamed something that you might get while, while sat in a room with somebody. I think what I've seen happen over time, and I think it's just maybe, you know, and I think today's a great example of that. I think as we become more comfortable with this as a medium, more comfortable with this as a way of, of us communicating and doing business, I think a lot of those barriers have gone. You know, I think we are, I, I certainly feel I'm really not missing anything that I would have missed in a room. Is it possible to prepare for next year, Paul? Are, are your customers looking ahead to next year or is it just not something people are thinking about too much right now? 
I, I think there's a bit of both, and I think it does depend hugely on who you are as a as, as a business and the kind mm. of the way you're doing it. I mean, I mentioned it, you know, over the, the last seven, eight months, as you can imagine, they've kept us pretty busy. We've worked a lot with the NHS in our locality, um, a lot of stuff around Teams, Office 365, um, but we're also working with some kind of our local authority partners as well in terms of some of their strategic planning. So I think for those organisations, they are very much thinking ahead because they've got, uh, I think their role going forward is, is very much defined. Uh, but I think in general, people are thinking ahead as well. You know, I think we've, we've got to a point where people now have an idea of what the next year is going to look like for them. I think they've seen the kind of the you know, the huge impact that this has had, you know, and, and absolutely we've worked with customers who have shed a lot of their workforce of closed factories down, you know, we, we have seen the the kind of worst end of this, but, but I think there is a general optimism in terms of people looking ahead and thinking we're here now, what do we do? And I think one of the things that people are planning is, you know, and it was kind of touched on in, in the last question where people have adopted zoom teams, etc., cetera, and, and adopted and moved very quickly to new ways of working. Mm. I think at the moment there are a whole number of projects around, as Regina kind of touched on earlier on, things like security, but retrofitting some of this kind of stuff. So projects that were rolled out that might have taken three years, got rolled out in three months. A lot of those businesses are now looking and, and talking to the, you know, talking to partners, talking to consultancy businesses about what have I, to, what should I have done? I've done this, but what should it have looked like? You know, so so I think some real interesting opportunities in that space as well. Absolutely. Regina, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think for us, a lot of the conversations we've been having with customers in terms of planning and looking forward is very much um, it's planning to be flexible and it's planning for disruption. And we've kind of we've shown now that we can do that. You know, this is this is a disruption that, you know, a lot of people won't ever come across in their working lives again. And we've now shown that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've now shown that you can kind of, you can put things in place that enable you to deal with that and to not, you know, whether it's um, a natural disaster, whether it's down to weather, whether it's leaves on the track, you know, it, you don't need people in the office so much anymore. And so it's, um, I think when we're looking forward, yes, you know, hopefully there will be some face-to-face -face meetings. Hopefully things will start to kind of come to a bit of an in-between of what we had before and what we've got now. Um, but the plan, you know, for a long time, a lot of our customers were, you know, we don't quite know what the future is going to look like. And so we're scared to invest in projects. Um, we're definitely seeing different types of projects, but there is investments now being made and people are starting to um, to adapt. And, you know, this is the new, and I hate this phrase, but this is the new normal um, that, you know, we we can live with this, whether or not there's a vaccine, whether or not people are allowed back in the office. Like we were just saying, you know, there's a million benefits to working the way that we are now. And so companies are putting um, a bit of a, a halfway point in place. Um, and if they can scale up, scale down, it doesn't matter now. Um, so, yeah, there's there's definitely plans, but they're different plans. Yeah, absolutely. Carson, would you agree? Are you seeing the same sort of things from your customers? Yeah, not only um, I would also really, you know, challenge all our channel partners actually to start planning for this new future, so to speak. Um, with a huge distributed workforce, there is still lots of opportunities for a business. Uh, while maybe before there was a lot of, uh, you know, services and IT equipment around on-premises. Uh, so I think there's a big movement happening there, which actually does leave a lot of opportunities. I would also like to think that, you know, should I always call it a forced migration to cloud? It just leaves a lot of, uh, you know, services as a service, if I may call that as a whole, uh, which I think is, uh, it leaves a lot of business on the table for for all uh, to actually grab for. Uh, the 5G rollout will allow us to be connected in a much faster way, in a much uh, broader way, which can actually, as I said before, enable uh, more uh, tools that actually we can use in our capabilities of actually driving our, our sales. Uh, monitoring was an element where I think actually as a, a channel partners can play a big role. Um, I would also like to think that, you know, we have actually seen across the pandemic a lot of supply chain uh, challenges, especially in the beginning. I don't think we see that as much anymore, but I would like to think that also that leaves a lot of business opportunities for, for channel partners as well. We are seeing uh, uh, quite a lot of projects still. Uh, I would not even go as far as to say we see less projects. We see somewhat different projects, right? Some customers decided actually to move, as I said, to move ahead with uh, with investments because they saw 
a huge need to actually al allow data access to all these mm -hmm. uh, distributed uh, people, uh, while others actually maybe push it a little bit ahead. So I think overall, we're probably seeing less investments in on-premise, more on cloud, whatever that may be, and uh, on remote workforces. And I think these are the areas where, and then of course, monitoring service, cybersecurity, uh, we talked about digital transformation, resilience, all those elements I think are uh, areas of opportunities for probably most channel partners. Yeah, absolutely, a lot of nodding going on there for sure. Um, if I could sort of come on to Regina again uh, with our next question, what are the positive business takeaways that, that you've noticed from your experiences over this past year? Um, so I think a lot of the, the customer relationships that we've had have really deepened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has been difficult to kind of to build that relationship with new business, um, but the existing customers that we've, we've had, um, there's much more of an advisory capacity and there's this kind of feeling that we're in it together. And so what are you guys doing about this? You know, we've got the same business challenges they do. And so we've, we've really deepened our relationship um, with a lot of our customers, which is wonderful. Um, I think there's also an element, and we were talking about this um, earlier, was in terms of that kind of getting to know people on a personal level, you know, you get people's kids running in and pets running in and um, it's, you know, it, it is a substitution for that face-to-face with -face, the 10 minute chat before a meeting, you get to know people's personal lives. And, you know, from a company perspective, as well as, you know, for, for our customers, it's been really nice to, to get to know a different side of them. I think a lot of the things that Regina just talked about there, you know, it's it, that, that chance to build relationships, I think has been huge. You know, one of the things that we've seen is uh, an, an eagerness from uh, our customers to engage in perhaps ways that they wouldn't have done previously because they just want to talk to somebody else. You know, they're, they're I, I can only talk to this fella for so long sat behind me, uh, be, you know, before before I need other human interaction. Um, so, so I think that, the, that that's that been a huge positive. And I think people are saying, but, you know, and actually using this technology to help to develop that as, as channel partners with their customers has been you know, one thing that we've benefited from hugely is every two or three weeks, making sure with those customers, there's something in a diary for a 30 minute doesn't have to be about work just a 30 minute how are things how are you getting on how are the kids you know what, what's the latest is there anything we can help with it doesn't have to be a hard sales call so you know so i think that's that's been something i think from from a tech you know as technologist i think from a technology point of view it, it's been interesting to see how organizations have seen the value of their technology you know we touched on this idea of digital transformation but the more more we digitize our businesses you know the more that organizations see the value in that technology investment and I think one thing that was quite interesting, and a couple of our customers spoke to this, not only have they seen the value of technology investment, but they've also seen the negative impact of underinvestment over time. So so for quite a lot of businesses where they hadn't spent money on IT because, you know, IT is just something that sucks money out of the organization somewhere. Suddenly we're coming to these guys and saying, yeah, can you do, can you do that technology thing to make sure that the business keeps running so that we can engage with our customers, we can sell our services. So, you know, I think those those kind of areas – understanding the importance of technology, understanding investment in technology has real value. And the flip side, you know, as Regina was talking about, that kind of, you know, building those kind of relationships, using the technology, using it in a positive way to, to I, I, I'm reticent to say friendships because I think there's always a bit of a, a, a customer supply, but, but I think as best as you can, you know, be, be there as somebody, I'm not there to try and sell you something all of the time. I'm just trying to find out how you're getting on and, and be genuine about that, you know. So, so I think, you know, I, I do think they're, they're real positives. And just one thing I just wanted to throw in on the, on the final point as well. Uh, so on the last point was that idea of, I think, where organisations, uh, where organisations had to change really quickly and a lot of their customers and suppliers and partners were, were patient in terms of everybody was trying to do their best. I think maybe just one word of warning for people listening to this who perhaps aren't looking ahead necessarily – I don't think partners, customers, suppliers will be as patient next time round. You know, whether next time is this or something else, they, they will expect us to have that level of resilience in place that we can deal and have the flexibility and, and IT now, if you like, to, to deal with this kind of stuff. So, so may, you know, may, they're, they're my three things anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And Carson, what, what are your positives? No, and I think, uh, as Paul just mentioned, I think it's a, it's a very, very good statement to say that we should probably not expect everybody to be as patient in the, in the future as they were in the past. And I think actually in the channel, we probably play a complementary role here, right? So whether we are vendors, distis, or resellers, or, you know, in any capacity, consultants, installers, um, I think that there is um, 
I mean, I really welcome the collaboration uh, and I really welcome the, the need for an increased collaboration. I think probably we all been around in the in a channel relationship long enough to understand that we've seen someone gone rogue. I think we'll probably tend to see that probably a little less in the future. Uh, I think we've all come to realize that we have our natural, uh, you know, our natural place in this. And, um, and if we actually manage to, you know, increase that collaboration, one way or the other, I think uh, I think that will be the benefit of the industry as well as, of course, uh, the customer who is in the center of everything we want to do. So, I think that is a, I think that's a that's a brilliant a brilliant point Paul came up with. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Regina, if I come to you for our sort of final uh, penultimate question, what have you appreciated most from your vendor partners this year? Um. Quite a few things. I, I have to say, I've been really impressed with a lot of our vendors who who have really stepped up um, in things like supply chain. They have kind of, you know, they've bent over backwards to make sure that we've got the things that we need that we can deliver to customers when they need it. Um, in terms of support, in terms of communication, um, they've really stepped up with communication and keeping us up to date on what they're doing. Um, going above and beyond and offering remote support and additional, you know, kind of the support that we need not the kind of you know generic um stuff you tend you tend to get sometimes um so yeah they they've really um they've been really flexible um in terms of pushing things through in terms of delaying things um so yeah i just i have to say i think as a as a whole i think the the vendors have really really done a great job with supporting um resellers through this good to hear and then paul would you agree uh, I, th I think it potentially a bit of a mixed message. Um, uh, to us, I, th I think absolutely what Regina said. I've, I've seen that in some of our vendors um, that they have been very supportive. I think where they've been able to, for example, they've offered flexibility around services. So, you know, lots of lots of people took advantage of Microsoft offering their E1 license for free so they could use Teams and, and Office 365. And, and we've seen other vendors where it's appropriate have been very supportive in terms of offering free services or you know and, and have been patient in terms of the, the way they've looked to operate you know we, we were with some vendors who came to us for example saying look we had all these marketing funds uh, that were available to us for events that we were going to run like you know in-person events we're not running any of those come to us with ideas about how we can engage with customers so that was really refreshing um but i think on the flip side there's been a few and, th and this is not a huge negative i mean don't get me wrong it's not a criticism i think you know i did say it before i think all of the vendors have tried their best you know they, they you know for some vendors it's easy you know it's easy for microsoft to give away e1 licenses it's it's harder for Lenovo to give away laptops. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, they're, they're very different problems, aren't they? Um, but I think from a, um, I think in some cases that they've not necessarily grasped the, the opportunity that's been presented to them. So, you know, their messaging, their marketing messaging, their, their approach hasn't really evolved to reflect some of the things that we're seeing out there in the market so you know so so i think it's maybe you know not not a huge not a criticism of them in terms of something but all oh, they really should have done but maybe in some cases they're missing the opportunity to position themselves as somebody who's genuinely there to help customers give them services you know and not just be not be somebody looking to make a fast book out of it because i think those that we go we we will remember those companies uh, you know i'm sure none of us have technology partners who've done that kind of thing but but just in general i think some of us will remember those companies who went out to make a fast book out of this and those who genuinely tried their best to to support the community whether that's business or or personal mm -hmm. so um so yeah i say i think mix i think a, a lot of cases yeah really supportive really flexible wanted to try and be innovative and do stuff but i think in some cases maybe just missed an opportunity to to position themselves in that way as well yeah that's very valid points actually um and coming to our final question for you Carsten what's Vertiv been doing for its partners you know specifically this year and what have you got up your sleeve for partners next year well I think um I'll probably just pick it up where, where Paul just left it I felt uh, obviously I felt that he was talking to well among others of course uh Vertiv um and I, I couldn't agree more I think um it probably depends on whether you see yourself as a vendor collaborating with the channel partners in the in, in the future. If there's one thing I've learned in my God knows how many years involved with channel is that uh, people never forget, right? Uh, and especially not the bad stuff. So I can only relate to the point that we have to treat each other well. Uh, I think that there is a lot of merit in understanding how we can, you know, by combined efforts actually grow the business better. Uh, you know, I think a lot of resellers 
and even to some degree, some distributors have actually been been suffering quite a lot. Uh, needless to say, a lot of small uh, projects and flow businesses just all of a sudden been wiped uh, further out. And uh, there's a lot of resellers that actually have been, been, been seeing that hit even in their balance sheets. Uh, so, you know, what we did in the past, uh, not saying that we did it perfectly well, but, but we, we really understood that we at one hand actually had a need for, uh, you know, the channel to carry inventory. And we actually increased the stack to actually fund some of that. Uh, in our partner program that we've launched, and we will see more of that next year, we're enabling partners to actually make more money from the very first dollar, euro, pound they actually spend, uh, rather than having crazy targets that they have to you know, try to reach and probably won't because of uh, in customers uh, uh, you know, extending projects. So I think, um, I think we as vendors actually have a responsibility to make sure that our channel, and I say our channel because it's a combined channel, it's not my channel, it's, it's Regina's, Paul's and my channel, that we all together are actually, you know, making that, making that work to the best of our efforts. And I can tell you that going forward, what we are spending a lot of time on, we have invested in tremendous amount more people to actually help the resellers, whether it's education, whether to understand the value proposition, whether to actually help with customer meetings, whether it's uh, marketing efforts, to try and actually create traffic in front of our resellers, because I think that is, is a shared responsibility as well. Um, but also, you know, let's, let's be honest, resellers will not stick around if they don't make money, right? There is an element of mind share, but there's certainly also an element of margin. It's businesses we're talking to. So at Verde, we take that quite seriously and we have actually increased the stack. We have actually expanded the, uh, the hard conditions, so to speak. It's not just all, oh, can you please help me, goodwill. There is actually additional dollars to, to, to be made. And I think we, we have to do that and we will continue to do that. And I will just invite all of you to pretty much just uh, come to me and let me know what that actually means in terms of hard dollars because we want it, right? I mean, we are as dependent as the channel, as, uh, as, as, as the channel, as probably from vendors in general. So I think this is a... This is, this is why I think it's so important that we understand how to collaborate going forward. Absolutely. Really, well, thanks very much for that, Carsten. Some, some great messaging there for, for partners and everybody watching. So we've actually come to the end of our discussion today. It's gone really quick. So thank you very much to our panellists. Thank you, Regina, Paul and Carsten. Definitely some really good points made there and hopefully lots of things for everybody watching to take away. Um, I think despite everything... Our industry is in a, a pretty good position going forward, and uh, we have a lot to be positive about. I hope you all agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks very much, everyone, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.